called The Runaway when we are, as we are going through the book of, uh, of Jonah. Now, Jonah, um, he is this prophet in the Old Testament who we don't know a huge amount about, um, but one of the few things that we do know is that he wasn't a very good prophet uh, in, uh, in what he did. This prophet, he had been called by God to, um, to share uh, God's love with um, and God's message of repentance with this city of Nineveh. And uh, Jonah, at every single turn, he ran the opposite way. Um, he ran the opposite way of what God had been calling him to do in sharing uh, God's message of repentance with this city of Nineveh. And this book, uh, as we saw, as we started our series last week, um, the way that we are supposed to read it is as a mirror. There are things that Jonah does in his life that we are to see um, any parts of ourselves that might be reflective of some of the poor behaviour that Jonah has. This guy Jonah, he was supposed to be uh, God's messenger and God's mouthpiece to this uh, city of Nineveh, but unfortunately he doesn't do a, uh, a great job as we saw as we began this, city, uh, this, uh, this series last week. In, uh, in chapter 1 of Jonah... Um, which, we, which we looked at last week. Um, we see that God had seen Nineveh, and in the first couple of chapters, we already see that, that Nineveh was a wicked city, and uh, God was calling um, these people to repent of their sin uh, and turn towards God. This city of Nineveh was probably the largest city uh, in the world at the time. It was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, a major empire uh, in the world of, uh, at the time. Um, it was the center of trade and, uh, and economics and culture. So this city that, uh, that God is calling to repent and turn to Him is an incredibly important place uh, of influence uh, during the time. Uh, where we would find the city of Nineveh today would be in modern-day uh, Iraq. Uh, now, it wasn't simply uh, God's people, it wasn't simply Israel who found um, the city of, of Nineveh as a wicked, depraved city. This was well known by the people at the time. I mentioned last week that even philosophers like, um, like Aristotle had uh, written down in his writings that he found the city of Nineveh to be a depraved, wicked city. And so Jonah was sent by God to tell this whole city, this massive group of people, to repent of their sin and turn to God. Now, this prophet, he has a tendency, as we see that unfolds through the book of Jonah, that he doesn't do what God has, has told him to do. And so, Jonah ran away. He went in the uh, exact opposite way, heading towards Tarshish, uh, away from Nineveh. He hopped on a boat, and, uh, and when he hopped on the boat, he, he went down into the, uh, into the bottom of the boat, went to sleep, um, and I'm guessing that he thought, I've, I've made it, I've gotten away from what I need to do uh, in, in going and sharing this news with Nineveh. Um, but as soon as he was on that boat and got on the waves for a little bit, there was a massive storm um, and the sailors who were, who were on the boat at the time, um, they did what Jonah asked and they threw him into the ocean. They, uh, they threw him into the ocean because Jonah would rather have died than go and share God's love and compassion with this city of Nineveh. We see that that is Jonah's heart motivation later on in, in chapter 4. Now, even in this moment, Jonah feels like he has beaten God, that he's gotten out of what he had been called to do. Yes, he had run away from God, but in this moment of jumping into the ocean, he would rather die than share God's love and compassion with the city of Nineveh. And then we pick up right at the end of, uh, of chapter 1, where we see this famous part of, of Jonah's story, uh, in the very last verse, which says, Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights. Now, although that's important, although it's important for us to be aware that Jonah was in the belly of a fish for, for three days and, and three nights, the fish 
is not the main character of, uh, of the story of Jonah. Many of us, we may have grown up thinking that the fish is the main part of the, uh, of, of the story of Jonah, but it is a secondary character in, uh, in this story. Now, I've had a whole heap of people uh, ask me different stuff about what this big fish was. Was it a whale? Was it a big shark? Was this the resurgence of the megalodon? Was there something... Uh, really sinister about this, this fish? I don't know, and personally, I'm, I don't really care too much either, because that's not the detail that is uh, shown here in Scripture. It's not important in particular what type of fish that Jonah had been swallowed by. The fact is that he had been swallowed by a fish, and that's a pretty uncomfortable place to be. And this was God's way of forcing Jonah to go where he wanted him to be. So Jonah, um, sailing away from God, he had now been swallowed by this fish, captured, and, and he didn't have a choice. He was now going to Nineveh, whether he liked it or not. And this would have been a, uh, a um, pretty, pretty disgusting place to be. Um, what we can be assured of is that over three days and three nights, that God was supernaturally sustaining Jonah throughout this time. This is uh, an incredible thing that, that Jonah was able to survive through this time, because we can't underestimate how disgusting and awful a time this would have been. We can't just simply brush over the fact that Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. This is a difficult place for Jonah to be, especially when we start looking at our next chapter in chapter two. When I was... Um, <coughs> When I was a lot younger, um, before I went into pastoral ministry, uh, I had a, a job doing outside school hours care uh, at, a, at our local PCYC. Um, I absolutely loved doing this job. It was a, a great job. I really did get to play games with, with primary schoolers for a living. It was, uh, it was fantastic. Um, but I didn't start my career there loving this job because I started when I was 16 years old. Now, whenever you start uh, any, any job when you're about 16 years old, you are at the very bottom of the, of the chain, and you get all of the rubbish jobs to do. And so, I was doing the setup for all of the activities that, was hap that were happening. Um, I did a lot of the, the cleaning around the place. But there was one job in particular that I hated above all others, and that's when issues happened in the toilets, whatever they were, that was my job to fix that up as a 16-year-old. And, uh, and so I spent years doing that, that as, a, as a career, and I had no great love doing it. If you know anything about me, I have an incredibly weak stomach as well. So that was very unappealing for me to do. Um, but I stayed at the PCYC for, uh, for a few years, um, and I ended up working my, my way up. And it, great me, it brought me great joy when I became a senior supervisor and I had heard something had happened in the toilets that was unpleasant and I was able to send the junior supervisors off to, uh, to deal with it. Um, anyway, after that, I, I ended up going into, into youth ministry. I became a youth pastor and I thought those days are behind me. There is no way that I'll have to do that ever again. Uh, little did I know, teenagers are more disgusting than, than primary school kids. And so, after a couple of, um, after a couple of sleepovers, uh, there was some serious cleanup that had to happen in, uh, in one of our, our bathrooms. And I still remember there was one time in particular where I was really not doing well needing to clean up this stuff. And I could hear, because Ash and her husband Carlton were my youth leaders at the time, they was laughing their heads off at me that I, uh, that I had to clean up this stuff all by myself. I ended up getting my, uh, my own back later on, though, because as soon as I finished youth pastoring at this church, then they had to take over running the youth ministry, and I still remember they sent me a photo once of stuff that they had to deal with, and I just thought, I've gotten my own back right here. They, uh, they've had to, to deal with this. Now, in those moments that our, that our stomach churns and even saying that kind of stuff, I've already got a, a weak stomach as I just talk about that, that sort of thing. 
we have to be aware when we, when we speak about Jonah being in the belly of a fish for three days, this is a disgusting place to be. Even in those moments when you can do clean up, the maximum time it'll usually take is probably about half an hour and you can deal with it and get past it. But can you imagine being in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights? Now, when I say fish, don't picture the smell of barramundi with some macadamia um, sprinkled over it and maybe some, some garlic butter. No, we're talking about fish that has been left out in the sun for days and it's right in your face. This is a gross place for Jonah to be. It is an uncomfortable place for him to be as well. Um, is anyone here claustrophobic? Maybe a, oh, a couple of people are a little bit claustrophobic. Um, but this would have been a place where he would have been cramped in and he would have actually gotten cramps throughout his, his legs and his arms. It would have been a, a very difficult time, time for him. And there wouldn't have been much for him to be able to do except to pray. It was probably the only thing that he could do. There wasn't the, uh, the Nineveh channel on Netflix while he was there in the, uh, in the belly of the fish. Um, praying was probably the only thing that he was able to do. Would have been dehydrated, would have been uh, hungry, would have been blind, he wouldn't have been able to see anything, uh, would have been immensely claustrophobic. So this is a situation that has been probably the worst moment in his entire life and this is the time after everything that he has gone through, this is the moment that he is led to praying to God. And so in chapter 2, we see Jonah's prayer of repentance. Or should I say, his prayer of almost repentance. The reason I say that this is Jonah's prayer of almost repentance is that there is still... Um, there is still moments throughout it, significant moments, where it is more about him and some of the good that he has done, rather than expressing a genuine changed heart before, before God. Now, this word repentance, um, we see it throughout Scripture, we see it throughout the New Testament, and what it means is a change of mind. So, you think one way in particular, and then repentance is turning around, doing a 180 degree turn, and going into the opposite direction. But we don't see this in all of its fullness revealed here throughout Jonah chapter 2. There are moments of, of repentance, um, but he still hadn't turned his heart fully back, uh, back to God. And so we pick up in Jonah chapter 2. If you've got your Bibles, I invite you to turn there, Jonah, uh, Jonah chapter 2, which says, from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled around me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. And this is where the language shifts. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pits. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. In this, um, in this brief chapter that we've just read, in chapter 2, the style and the way that Jonah is written changes for a second, because um, if you notice, especially in chapter 1, the story goes pretty fast. 
there is a narrative um, that is being communicated here through the book of, of Jonah, but in chapter 2, there is a break that happens, and here we see um, the language focus in upon the specific prayer of, uh, of Jonah. Now, before we can look at the words that are, that are spoken about in this prayer, we need to see the moment that this prayer takes place. Jonah has um, been running from God, he has been thrown into the ocean, he has been sinking to the depths, he has been swallowed by a whale, and it is only at this point that he begins praying to God. Now, I would say this is the very definition of someone praying as their last resort. There's a common phrase that is a, a true phrase, that prayer should be our first response, not our, uh, not our last resort. Prayer should be our first response, not our last resort. Now, there is no point in our prayer life, there is no point in our, uh, in our journey with God, where God will ever say to us, I will not listen to your prayers, you are are uh, not my child. I won't listen to you anymore because you didn't pray enough. We can't, um, but we can save ourselves um, a huge amount of unnecessary pain and difficulty in our life if, in these moments of, of trouble and, and difficulty, we simply stop in the midst of it and we pray to God. This should be our first response. But when did Jonah start praying? In distress. That's the language that it, that it uses. That's the moment when he started praying, when he had been sinking to the bottom, when seaweed was wrapped around his head, when he had sunk down and realized that he didn't want to die. That's when he cries out to God, when he has nothing left. More specifically, the, uh, the language that is used here, um, we see it in verse 2. The time that, uh, that Jonah cries out to God is from deep in the realm of the dead. Now, um, if you're reading from a different version right now, in verse 2, you may see different language here. In the, uh, in the New International Version, it speaks about uh, that Jonah cried out to God from deep in the realm of the dead, um, the King James Version says hell, but the word that is actually used here in verse 2 when Jonah cried out is this word Sheol. Now, this word is used several times throughout the Old Testament, and the way it's used is to describe the lowest point in all creation, that this is the equivalent of the grave. And so, when it says Jonah is crying out from Sheol, this is the lowest point that he could possibly be in. There is no way out in this moment. And in verse 6, it goes one step further, and it says that he is barred in by Sheol. He feels trapped by the grave, that there is no way out for him in this moment. This is how Jonah is feeling throughout the first six verses of, um, of this chapter, that he had been sinking down to the depths and he had been ready to embrace Sheol, feeling trapped in by it, but God had redeemed him out of, uh, out of that pit. That he had made that decision, um, but in this dark moment he cries out to God. Now, I have found personally that this is the natural behaviour, the natural inclination that many of us have when we are choosing to, to pray. We might say, yes, I seek God before all other things, but it is in these moments of Sheol, of grave, of being in our darkest moments when things are caving in around us, that they are the moments when we are most likely to cry out to God, when everything's caving in. But this is not how God intends for it to be. We shouldn't just be crying out to Him during these moments. On the screen, I've got a, um, a picture right now. Um, this is uh, Wellington Point uh, on the south side, the, the dark south side of, of Brisbane. 
Um, but I, uh, I grew up on the south side. I know, please for, forgive me for, for that. I've become a, become a north sider. Um, but uh, this was one of my favourite places um, when, I was, uh, when I first became a Christian. This particular picture is the, uh, is the jetty at, at Wellington Point. Um, and it's the place I always went to pray to God and just spend time with Him. Um, it just has, it's one of these places that just has real, real meaning for me. Um, but there was a, a couple of years for me uh, when I first got out of, of high school that were quite um, dark points. Um, and I stopped seeking God, I stopped praying to Him, I would say I was very much reflecting the life of, of a Jonah, and I had spent um, yeah, a couple of years just, just running away from what God wanted for, uh, for, my, for my life. Um, anyway, I'd, uh, after a, a couple of years, I'd, um, I was just going for, for a walk down at Wellington Point, and I got to this, this spot and I remembered of all of those times previously, a couple of years before, that I had spent time with God, that I had gone down pretty much every single day and just wanted to, to seek His face. And that was a turning point in my life because I was in a bit of a crisis moment during, uh, during that time. And yet this is not what God intended for me and this is not what God intends for any of us. It's not just simply in crisis points in our life that we should be crying out to Him, although that's what He, he wants. Every single moment of our life, this is, should be our, our journey with God. Prayer should not be the last resort, it should be our first response. Part of the, the heart of this book of Jonah, as we, uh, as we journey through it, is that... Um, is that every single point that he is running away from God and, uh, and not doing what God has, has called him to do, he is not just running away from what God wants him to do, but thematically um, he runs towards death. This, uh, this book doesn't just give uh, an account of some events that happened around someone's life, but this metaphor of Jonah when he runs away from God, running towards death is brought up again and again. So whenever he runs away from God, he's running towards Sheol, the grave. And uh, we see this theme carried on as well throughout the New Testament. Um, for those who are followers of Jesus, we are called from death into life. And so we see this picture once again here, that in those moments when Jonah runs away, he is not just running away from God, but he is running towards death. He's running away from life. But when we come to God through Jesus, when we repent of our sin, when we do what the Ninevites do later on in chapter 3, and we come to Jesus, we experience life in Him because of Jesus' life, because Jesus rose again. We are no longer prisoners of Sheol and the grave and death. We have now been given new life. And so when we run towards God, we experience His life and everything that it brings. And Jonah eventually gets to this point where he stops wallowing in grave and Sheol and he turns towards God and experiences life, sort of. There's all these sort ofs throughout this, this chapter. Because in verse 6, we see... Uh, the language changed about halfway through because it says, but you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. And then this last section is really key. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. One of the problems that we can think about when we um, come to this idea of repentance and turning from our sin back to God is we may have an understanding of repentance that it is simply feeling bad about our sin. It's simply acknowledging the things that we have done wrong before God. But the point of repentance 
is far greater than that. There should be an acknowledgement of what we have done wrong and against God in our life. Yes, that's part of the process, but there is also doing a 180 flip, turning back to God. That is um, the part of the process that Uh, that Jonah leaves out, however, is this first part of the process. There is no significant acknowledgement of the sin of him running away from God. He simply says, I needed you, God, and you helped me. You rescued me when I was in distress. And because you helped me, then I will do what you want. But that is not true repentance. Jonah does take a step towards God, but there is no acknowledgement of the sin in his life. Now, in our Western culture, we are usually inclined towards doing this first step very well. We are often very good at acknowledging our sin, but the next part of the process is doing what we see in the second part of verse 6 and onwards, is turning back to God and experiencing the salvation that He brings. And that also means leaving the guilt and shame of our past and of our sin in the past. We don't need to be embracing and living in Sheol, in the grave, in death anymore when we run and turn away from our sin and run towards God. All of these steps are involved in in repentance. And the final step that we see throughout this prayer of almost repentance is what we see that I mentioned before in verse 9, where Jonah says, "'What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord.'" It's only in this moment that Jonah responds to what God had called him to do, and he says, yes, I will go to Nineveh, I will tell these people what you asked me to do ages ago. And the very next thing, the very next words that we see after Jonah says, yes, I will share God's love and compassion with these people, is it's at that point that he is then vomited onto uh, dry land. At this point, we see Jonah recommissioned by God in a really disgusting way to then go and do what God had originally intended for him to do. It's when Jonah finally says yes to God and those things that he was calling him to that Sheol and the grave has finally lost its grip upon Jonah. Throughout this prayer of almost sort of repentance. Jonah, um, he doesn't do a great job of displaying a repentant heart, and yet even throughout his, um, his not displaying this, God is still pursuing him. Even when he is running away from God, and even when he's not pursuing God as, as he should, God is still pursuing him. There is still salvation available for Jonah, this hard-hearted, self-righteous prophet. And this is our story for, for many of us. No matter who you are, no matter how hard your heart has been, or whatever parts of Jonah you see inside yourself, God is still pursuing you. One group of... Uh, of people who I see in, uh, in the New Testament who often get a bad rap and are very similar to Jonah are the Pharisees. Um, now, there's a reason that the Pharisees get a bad, bad rap. They are quite self-righteous in their approach towards God, and yet we see many Pharisees who turn their hearts towards God and they have genuine salvation and encounters um, with, with Jesus. And so, even for those people who have hard hearts and a a sense of self-righteousness and pride in themselves, God is still pursuing them. God is pursuing all of us. Even when we're running from God, God is running after you. Jonah was like many of these Pharisees that we see throughout the, the New Testament, an 
uh, a view that what he was doing was always the, the right thing, um, and yet there was enough salvation even for him. It's true that God wants to save the most wicked and depraved of sinners like the city of Nineveh, but it's also true that God wanted to save Jonah. There was salvation there for Jonah, for this proud person who had run away from God and thought that his way was better. And for us, we should, we should let that sink into our hearts. Even if there are elements of pride in your heart, even if there are elements of resistance to God or thinking that your way is better, God is pursuing you. He's running after you. There is salvation for you and for every single one of us. That is an amazing truth that our God is always running after all of us. Let's pray together. God, you are so kind towards us. You are so um, gracious to us, your people, that even in our um, even in our pride and even in those moments when we think our own way is better, that you are still pursuing us, you're still running after us. And we see that most clearly demonstrated through the person and the work of Jesus. Jesus, we thank you that you did choose to pursue us even to the grave. that you chose to die for us, that for those who repent and turn from their sin and believe in you, they may have everlasting life. They won't be prisoners of the grave anymore, barred in by Sheol, but they will be able to experience full and eternal life. And Jesus, I just really ask that, uh, that today for anyone who may have had, maybe not, um, explicit, overt wickedness in their life, but for those who maybe have um, hard hearts, for any of us who maybe have been running from you and thinking that our way is better, that you will work in us, that we will repent of that, that we will have our minds changed and our hearts changed, and we'll do a 180 back into your arms. You are such a kind and loving and compassionate God to everyone. And so for all of us afresh today, we just surrender ourselves and run back to you. In Jesus' name, amen.